Welcome back. In a moment, we'll continue our discussion about the International Criminal Court. But first, here are some other stories to keep an eye on. And it's a world full of political turmoil. Italy's Prime Minister, Matteo Renzi, has resigned after suffering a bruising defeat in a hard-fought referendum campaign. Italians were asked to vote on constitutional reform that would have weakened the Senate and handed greater powers to the central government. It's seen as another victory for so-called anti-establishment sentiment. The same sentiment drove Britain's exit from the EU and today the country's Supreme Court is hearing arguments about whether politicians should be able to vote on it before the UK government makes its formal request to leave Europe. The hearing is expected to last four days, with a result not due until next year. And the New Zealand Prime Minister, John Key, has made a shock announcement that he's going to step down from his role, citing family reasons. Deputy Prime Minister Bill English will likely take over until the ruling party holds a caucus to choose a new leader. Let's return to our conversation about the International Criminal Court. I'm joined now by Toby Cadman, who's a barrister who has acted in cases before the ICC. What's it like to prepare a case before this court as against any other? Well, um, when we're looking at the International Criminal Court or International Criminal Tribunals generally, uh, we're dealing with very, very complex areas of law. Uh, we're dealing with war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, which are very complex cases by their very nature. Uh, and I've acted as a defence counsel and as a member of a defence team. Um, and also I've, I've acted in prosecution as well uh, when I spent time in Bosnia. Um, so these are very, very complicated cases. It's a complex area of law, uh, often involving uh, issues of protected anonymous witnesses, um, probably one of the greatest challenges is the, the amount of time these, these cases take. Uh, international tribunals, unfortunately, um, or the wheels of international justice move very slowly. Um, that's been one of the greatest criticisms, I think, of many of the international tribunals. Is it difficult to get witnesses to actually take part in the process? Often it, it is. Um, again, you know, we're dealing with mass crimes, mass human rights violations. Um, compelling people to come forward to, to give evidence either for the prosecution or the defence in cases such as this is always very, very difficult. Um, you have to ensure that there are effective mechanisms in place, not only for credible investigations, but also to ensure that witnesses can give evidence in a way that protects their safety uh, for ultimately when they have to return to their home countries. And as a barrister, uh, with all the qualifications that entails, are you involved, if you like, on the detective work of evidence gathering to make sure that's done properly so it won't you know, crumble once it comes before the court? Well, looking at it both as a prosecutor and as a defence counsel, so um, the prosecuting work that I had done um, involved a great deal of hands-on uh, investigations. Right. Now, of course, you are working with uh, experienced criminal investigators. A lot of those that were used in Bosnia were from all around the world, um, homicide investigators um, and individuals that had spent a great deal of time investigating these types of cases. I mean, in domestic situations such as the United Kingdom, that might be done by a police service, wouldn't it, to gather Absolutely. a case? and then put it to the legal profession to say, right, is there enough evidence to prosecute? Let's go ahead and, yeah. and present our argument. So the work that needs to be done has to be cognizant, I suppose, of all the local restrictions and, and the local circumstances where the alleged offences took place. Absolutely, and indeed that's one of the greatest criticisms of the ICC in particular, is that they don't have a large enough body of investigators to go out... Or competent and enough? Well, they, they certainly don't have enough uh, bodies, um, and so they're quite often they have to rely on local investigators, they have to rely on third parties like NGOs providing information. We've seen cases collapse at the ICC um, as a result of that. For example, the Lubanga case almost collapsed because of the fact that there, there were serious credibility questions as, as to the integrity of the investigations. And certainly the, the Kenya case that I worked on when I was part of the defense team, that was one of the main issues, was the credibility of the defense witnesses and the credibility of the investigations. And again, um, those cases collapsed before they went to trial. And the very nature of the offenses, because some of the crimes that people are being accused of are pretty heinous, um, they may not be around 
Um, certainly other people who witnessed these things going around, they may have, I don't know, passed on or perished or been, been killed by some other action. So there's difficulties every step of the road on these things, isn't there? Absolutely, yes. And, and again, um, one of the other criticisms of the ICC is because of the lack of state support, because of the lack of funding, they don't have those mechanisms in place that you would have on a smaller level. Uh, for well, like witness protection, for instance. Exactly. You, those witnesses need to be relocated. That requires um, state uh, cooperation, state participation. You, know, you, you need to have the, uh, the ability of some of the more powerful states, like the United Kingdom, the United States, that, that will provide support for relocating. Uh, witnesses and of course in a lot of these cases the, the the strongest evidence that you would have is often insider witness so people who have actually uh, participated in the crimes themselves but at a lower level giving evidence against against their civilian Which you surely as a, as a defense lawyer could pick holes in right away so oh, absolutely their, their statements are unreliable or they cannot be proven there's no of the sort of modern criminality evidence, uh, like video footage or anything like that, to back this up, is it? You're dealing in a very difficult area. Well, you are, but you, you would also seek to corroborate anything that an insider witness or a protected witness would say by, by the use of documentation, for example. Um, and, a, and a lot of trials now rely heavily on that. So, for example, uh, one of the areas that I've been involved with, certainly for the last two years, is, is investigating um, war crimes in Syria. And a lot of that relies on documentation because a lot of these military uh, units and, and um, security forces in countries such as Syria, um, everything is very, very mechanical. Um, it's almost well, it's quite bureaucratic, is it? Very, very bureaucratic. What, there's a paper trail? There is, there is a paper trail, yes. And, really? And one of the groups... I'm surprised. Well, one of the groups that we work with have, have been spending uh, a great deal of time and effort over the last two years in, in getting all of these documents out of the country. Mm. Um, we also have, uh, as, as one of the Syrian cases, which is called the, the Caesar file, I mean, we have 55,000 images that shows the level of, of torture, um, mass starvation that can go to show who was responsible. But of course you need to have a number of links in the chain to be able to connect that to, to those se senior commanders. And that, that takes a great deal of effort. Regrettably, the ICC, and another one of its failings, is it doesn't have jurisdiction to deal with the conflict in Syria. And so you have to find other ways to, to bring those cases. So given all the difficulties, given the, re the small, relatively small amount of funding, although its critics say it's overfunded, but the difficulty with staffing, the difficulty of quality of um, investigation in the actual country where offences are alleged to have taken place, is it actually doing any good at all? Yes, it is. Um, I, I have been very critical, or openly critical, of, of the way that it operates. I think there are a lot of things that need to change. But it is an essential institution. Um, it is hamstrung in many ways by the powerful states, such as the United States, China, Russia, India, um, not supporting it. Um, but I think that, that the, the institution and the, uh, and the idea behind the institution um, is very, very important. We need to have a centralized body. Um, the creation of ad hoc tribunals for different conflicts um, proposes or presents a number of complications itself. So having a centralized body that is effectively a, a global court for crimes of this kind um, is essential, but it needs to be properly funded, properly supported, and it needs to, to recognize that there are certain conflicts um, that it needs to look into. Um, one, uh, I hate to just focus on criticisms, but there are, of course, criticisms about Iraq, Afghanistan, um, and of course now Syria and Russia's involvement in Syria, that these are the, the, the situations that a court such as this should be looking at. Toby Cabman, good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. We end with our insight bite. This is a little something that we feel you should know. A Finnish game developer has created a mobile game where players score points by pointing out false Donald Trump tweets. Trump versus science allows users to blast contentious posts by the president-elect and is intended to draw attention to important global issues such as climate change. 
It's a simple game requiring players only to tap quickly on the touchscreen of their devices when they see an incorrect tweet. This fires off false symbols which land on the tweet, highlighting its accuracy. We're pretty sure that's right anyway. And that's all for now. I'm Martin Stanford. That was Insight.